Good morning, church. Good morning. I missed you guys so much. Oh my goodness. I also missed air conditioning. I'm not going to lie. So when Eric keeps saying that it's kind of surreal to be back because it, we were in a very, very different place last Sunday and the Sunday before, he really isn't kidding. Two Sundays ago, we were in a church building that was probably the size of the stage up here, maybe smaller, with the teensiest windows you've ever seen, but a hundred people packed inside. And it was a wonderful place to worship. It was an incredible experience um, at this particular church. This is the one they invited me to preach. Um, and it was 250,000 degrees. Um, and I didn't actually start preaching until two hours into the service, so I got up. And I'm sure at various points on this trip, Eric looked at me and said, I had no idea a human being could sweat so much. Um, I'm sure that was it, but I was up there saying, well, this is going to be short because I'm afraid I'm going to melt. So when he says that it's kind of surreal to be back, it is, but we are so grateful to be back. Um, And today, I know y'all have been talking about sex for the last two weeks, and that is a titillating topic, but if it's okay with you, we are going to just take a break this Sunday um, from our sex series. We'll pick it up next week, um, and I'm excited to pick it up, but I just wanted to share with you about our experience and the team's experience in Sierra Leone. Is that all right? with all of you. I apologize. I apologize if this gives you flashbacks to like your family's slideshows of pictures of their trip to Palm Beach. Um, I'm going to try to make this more fun. (laughs) Anyway, but I wanted to show you what we saw and encourage you to to think about even going yourself or ask yourself questions about what ways are you kind of getting out of your comfort zone and and seeing new ways that um, people are living around the world. Um, And these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So it was an incredible, an incredible experience. But before we get further in, let's pray. Holy and gracious God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this gathering of people, and thank you for the adventure that we have been on in the last two weeks. And thank you for bringing us safely back together. God, on this morning, we ask that what needs to be said, be said, and what needs to be heard, be heard. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, the living and risen Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. So we're going to start with a map so I can kind of show you where we were. Um, So we flew into Freetown, which is the capital of Sierra Leone, right over there, Um, and we stayed. We took a two and a half, three hour trip um, in a a truck um, along very bumpy roads, all the way to McKinney, um, which is a pretty big city in the middle of Sierra Leone. I've got it circled for you there. And that's where we ended up staying um, and sleeping each night. Um, And then outside of Sierra Leone, probably about 15, or outside of McKinney, about 15 minutes, the majority of our work was in this very small village called Minoko. Can you say that? Minoko? Minoko, Sierra Leone. Um, And it was an adventure, and it's so small, I literally couldn't find on Google, on the internet, where everything lies. I could not find a map of Sierra Leone where like the village of Minoko was placed. So that's how small it was. And th- but there are so many of these villages that surround um, these bigger towns and you only find them by kind of taking a junction and taking a left down this dirt road and you ask people where is a village and they just say, oh, just, you know, keep going keep going. So we were in Minoko um, doing the majority of our work. But a little background of Sierra Leone, 66 years ago, while we were there, they actually celebrated 66 years of their independence from Great Britain. So they had the... um, gained their independence 66 years ago. Um, They also, 15 years ago, finally saw the end to an 11-year-long civil war, uh, which is incredible because you've got all of these adults, the majority of the population there lived through it and saw it and experienced it. So that added certainly a layer of things we learned about Sierra Leone, a layer of their their culture. Um, We also, this was the first trip back that um, we went with an organization called Africa Uplifted. um, And this is the first year that they've been able to send teams back since the Ebola outbreak. So in 2014, Sierra Leone saw almost 3,000 deaths 
to Ebola. Um, and while we were driving along and seeing different parts of Sierra Leone, we occasionally even swerved by and stopped at um, a quarantine center, an Ebola camp, they called it. And we saw these, um, these houses and these wash stations and these places where people who had Ebola had to go and be quarantined and people could care for them there. We also learned a lot about the industry of Sierra Leone. The, obviously, um, lots of people have heard about this is where diamonds are mined, um, but they also they're living on a pretty much a bedrock of granite. So they mine a lot of granite. They mine a lot of ore. The dirt is so red there because of so much iron in the ground. Um, and we were passing, there was a train track that we saw that had 100 cars full of this red dirt, this red rock. Um, and so China actually uh, mines a lot of ore or buys a lot of ore um, and iron from Sierra Leone and then just trains it back or ships it back via trains. So it was an adventure, and it was very different for me, specifically. I had never been to the continent of Africa before. Um, and, for so, and, and it was never a place that I actually ever imagined myself going. It's very hot there. Um, we experienced probably, most of the time, the temps were in the 90s, um, but it was 100% humidity. So, you know, imagine taking a shower and then trying to dry off, and you're just pushing water around. <laughs> um, so why? I mean, I asked myself a few times, I'm not going to lie, why did I agree to this trip? But I am so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. Um, I agreed to this trip because it was definitely outside of my comfort zone. It was something I never imagined myself doing, never imagined myself going on. Um, I don't camp. I refuse. I mean, I think we've evolved as human beings. Why do we need to sleep on the ground? We have mattresses and showers, and it's beautiful. Um, so let alone, like, if I don't camp, this is certainly outside of my comfort zone. So I asked myself over and over kind of why. Why is it important that I go on this trip? Why is it important that, that we continually seek ways to get out of our comfort zone, to see how other people live around the world. And I went back to scripture, and maybe the most important piece of scripture found in our entire Bible, and that is the golden rule. And you read over and over and everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, um, and love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Over and over, Jesus asks us to live into this, that this is the culmination of all of the Old Testament, the law of the prophets, um, that, that we are to treat each other as we would like to be treated. But in order to live into that, in order to live into that commandment, that requires us to kind of put a different person's shoes on, to imagine what it might be like to be another person with dis different circumstances than we have, with different histories than we have, with different beliefs and different experiences. It is a holy task to get out of your life and your realm and imagine what it might be like for someone sitting next to you or someone living across the world. We are asked to put on each other's shoes, to follow Jesus. That Jesus kind of talks about over and over. I see him talking about the dangers of, of living a, a life that is kind of closed off to everyone else. A life that is too small, a world that is too small, where you are only worried about your own life, your own circumstances. Um, and you kind of put your own cares and dreams on other people. So over and over, Jesus asks us to get out of our comfort zone, to go meet um, and approach and engage with different people. So I was there to seek perspective because I think it is an important thing, that is an important thing to do as Christians is to seek the perspective of others, to see how other people live and to learn from each other and to support one another no matter where we come from. So... I wanted to share a little bit about what we saw while we were in Minoko. Is that all right? All right with all of you? Okay, so first we saw so many kids. Oh my goodness, so many kids. Aren't they sweet? Oh, every time you open the door, there was just a crowd of children that would run and they would see your car running up and they would come out and just scream, a porto, a porto, a porto, um, which it actually just stands for a white person or a white man. Um, Sierra Leone was named uh, by a was named by a Portuguese, um, uh, what am I looking for, explorer. Um, so, and they were actually, the Portuguese were the ones who, um, who 
came with slave ships to Sierra Leone. So that is their experience, and that's their history of white people in Sierra Leone, and that's why the name has kind of followed us. So it's strange to kind of smile and wave when someone is screaming... Portuguese white man, Portuguese white man at you. Um, but it's an important history to kind of sit back and think about. But we've got all of these sweet, sweet babies. Oh my goodness, Santiki was my, one of my favorite little dudes. He was the one in the gray shirt right there. Um, and it was just incredible. And they wanted to hold your hands over and over. They thought our skin was really cool because when you touch it, it, you can like leave little fingerprints. Theirs doesn't do that. And so literally it was just... Everyone wanting to touch your skin, but oh, you feel so special. <laughs> but oh, so the babies are beautiful and they are wonderful and they just give you life. So every time we arrived, um, there would just be these hordes of children that would come and just want to hang out with you and you want to get to know them and love them. Um, they are taught English if they are um, privileged enough and blessed enough to be going to school and to have a family that can, that can pay for their school fees. Um, they're taught in English. The national language of Sierra Leone is English. Um, but at home they speak Creole. So both, both folks kind of do the same thing. The other thing that I wanted to show you was this is the school that they built in Minoko. Um, it's a primary school, which means they offer uh, preschool to year six um, of school. So this school used to... Uh, Let's see, this school has been around for a while, but the folks that, they, it draws people in um, from a mile and a half away. So these kids make this mile and a half walk or run to school uh, most days, and if they go home for lunch, they're doing that twice a day, twice a day that trip. Um, they've got all these teachers. The teachers need to be trained, um, and that's a huge kind of push of Africa uplifted in the government is to try to train teachers to be teaching at these schools in these rural villages um, because if you don't have teachers around or if you don't have folks to teach the kids, then there is no school. Um, so there are the, all of these incredible souls that have come out of Minoko that have said, I'm going to go away and be, go through the training and then come back and I'm going to to teach my village and to teach these kids. Um, if you want to go to secondary school, the closest secondary school that any of the villages have is actually in McKinney. So, um, and it's not something that you just go to each day and then back out to your village. If your ch kid is going to go to secondary school, they need to find someone that they can actually stay with, either family or a friend or someone through church, someone that is willing to house them and take them in as they're going to secondary school in McKinney. And if you want to go beyond that, if you want to go to full university, the only full university you can find in Sierra Leone is in Freetown. And again, you have to go and move away from your home, away from your family, and find a place to live and to stay while you're going to school. That's a little different, isn't it? Can you imagine sending your seventh grader off to live with someone else so that they can go to secondary school in McKinney? It's just incredible. The next thing we saw was a clinic, the clinic that um, Africa uplifted in the United Methodist Church to get, church to get work together um, to build in 2010. Um, so these are two different pictures of the clinic. You've got kind of the main reception area, and then this is one of the exam rooms. So I think there were two exam rooms. There was a birthing room, um, and there were bathrooms and different things. Uh, and before the existence of this clinic, there were once a week, there would be nurses and doctors that would come to their community center, um, and people from all surrounding communities would flock each day, or each Saturday, to this community center. So now this uh, clinic is open pretty much seven days a week, and we, were we got a tour of all of Minoko, and we um, were walking along the river, and there were boats that were painted in specific ways, and they said those are the boats people use to get to the clinic. If they're coming from 15-plus um, miles away, to get to this clinic. So you've got local nurses that are dedicated to going out, to being trained, and then to come back and work in this clinic. And it is just incredible. The next thing I want to tell you about and what we saw um, are specifically the farming and what people grow and raise in Minoko. They raise goats and, and uh, chickens during the non-rainy season, and they plant cassava and rice, and there are mango trees everywhere, so those are constantly dropping. Um, another thing they harvest that they use so much um, are these pine, or not pine, good heavens, um, these palm nuts. 
So this is a guy named Michael, a kid named Michael, and he's carrying a huge sack of palm nuts. And they're about the size of, I don't know, a golf ball, uh, maybe smaller. They're bright red. They look like a kernel of corn on steroids. Um, but what people do, they harvest these from palm trees. They take them down, and then they put them in barrels, and they boil them for two or three days. And then they put them in these pits that they have dug out, and they stomp on them and squish them until the husk falls off. And then they boil them again, and the oil from those uh, palm nuts separates, and they skim the top off, and that's what they use to cook with. They use this palm oil to cook with. But they're not done. They further crack the seed open, and there's a teensier seed inside. And they boil that, and the oil coming from those seeds they use for laundry soap. So it is just incredible. They're harvesting coconuts, they're harvesting palm oil um, and laundry soap and these palm seeds. And it is just incredible to see their ingenuity. Um, they are geniuses when it comes to this and it takes the whole community to harvest these things. The other thing that the village of Minoko works so hard to harvest is sand. Minoko is right by a river um, that is beautiful and looks just like this. Um, but this is in the low season. So the rainy season is just about to start. The rainy season lasts four or five months long where it is just constant downpour. Um, and during the rainy season, it the river rises and floods floods these entire fields and it is like this for five months of the year. I was getting this tour of Minoko which was incredible but all of the houses seemed to be off and kind of under um, under these palm trees and where all of the trees were and there were these big open fields that were so dry and I wondered what in the world happens here um, and what happens is those where there aren't big tall trees that's because the river completely floods those areas and goes all the way up to the village. So during this time, during the rainy season and the river rising, um, when it finally recedes at the end of the rainy season, the river has carried in all of this sand, this fine, beautiful, white sand. And what the people do during the non-rainy season months in order to support themselves and support their family, they can't farm, obviously, during the rainy season, so they can't grow food, um, they, can't sell their, they can't sell as much as they used to. Um, so what they have done is they have started to harvest sand. People from McKinney and people from the larger towns will actually buy truckloads of sand from these small villages, and from them they'll make bricks and plaster uh, to, to make houses. So throughout the year, for what is it, a five, seven, seven months of the year, eight months, of, seven months of the year, entire families, day in, day out, are digging, are digging sand. And this was by far the most influential day I had there because it got us out to the river and it was like a, it was like a, a, a scene from the movie Holes or the book Holes, if you've ever seen that. Um, these pits, can we go back to the last picture? These pits are easily 12 feet deep. And I wondered, because I had seen all of these kids in days previous, they would come and they just were covered in sand. They had sand in their hair. And I thought, oh, you were just rolling around on the ground and off having fun. No, what I found out is if they had sand in their hair, they were out with their families helping dig sand. So you've got these folks who are digging and digging and digging and carrying buckets of sand on their head down to where the trucks can get to. And each family has a pile, a pile probably half the size of this center section of chairs. And each family has a pile and everyone respects each family's pile. They don't mess with it. They let um, each family work. And they sell this sand by the truckload. And that is the only way they have to support themselves through the rainy season. They use that money to buy rice to survive throughout the rainy season. And this was just an incredible, incredible sight. I was texting our other associate pastor, Leah, um, after this day because I just couldn't believe it. And I was telling her all the things and all the ingenuity that I saw and all the ways that they, they had come up with to support themselves and to use the land around them. And she asked if I just cried after seeing this. <laughs> And for a second, I was kind of I stopped because I thought that was a, a confusing question um, because I didn't. It never occurred to me to be sad because these folks were so proud of what they did. They were so proud to show us their way of life and to, to show us how they were supporting their family. And it struck me that 
you know, I was suddenly faced with, I think there is a constant struggle with folks who do mission work, amen, about what you go to do there and what good you are actually doing. If you go to a certain place, a place in a community that you're not a part of, are you going and actually doing good or are you doing more harm? Does anyone ex ask those questions of themselves when they're doing mission work? That's a hard, it's a hard question um, because it's so easy to go to a third world country if you're living in a first world country and say, oh, these poor people. Oh, these poor people that don't even know what they're missing. Um, it's so easy to kind of suddenly fall into this, we're leaving our ivory towers and going down to these, these mere people living in the third world country. But watching this community come together Watching this community work so hard to live, and not just live, but to support their family, to support their community, no matter how old you were, no matter what gender you were, you were at work, you were coming together, you were supporting one another, and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful and incredible sight to behold. When we are called into mission work, and we start to kind of butt up against those questions. What are you there for? Why are you here? I think it's, impo it's important to really reflect on what you see and what's in your own heart. And hopefully we can enter into these scenarios and we can meet people and realize that we are there to give and to receive. To see and to witness to one another. To witness to another life and to experience the wider community of saints. These people of Minoka, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Amen? And it was incredible and holy and a privilege to be invited into their world, to be invited into their community, and they were proud to show us. And I was so, so grateful. One of the earlier things that happened right at the beginning of our trip that is worth noting. Um, and the first kind of taste I had of this, this way of living as a community in Sierra Leone, we were driving from Freetown to McKinney, and like I said, it's about a two and a half hour, three hour car ride. And Lord knows the roads, the, pa the ones that are paved, they're hot, right? So if you're driving for two and a half or three hours on a very hot road, we were driving along and in the middle of nowhere, and when I say the middle of nowhere, I mean like the middle of nowhere. Um, and all of a sudden, bang. We heard this bang, we felt this pop, and a tire went out on our truck. And we swerved off, and our driver, Abu, is a genius um, and able to, he was able to get us to the side of the road safely. And, we thought, and the tire was even too hot to touch. It was, I thought, what are we going to do? But even though we were in the middle of nowhere, we were between these two large kind of ditches or the road was kind of dug in so people couldn't really see us. But all of a sudden over the hill, we saw these kids and they came to see and they came to wave. And then suddenly you look down the road and you squint and there's a whole group of men walking down the road. And without asking questions, without asking where we were from or what village we were headed to, they got down on their knees and they helped our driver change the tire and then push the car to get it started again. And I don't know where these folks came from. I don't know where they were living because I really didn't see anything for 10 or 15 minutes driving down this road. But out of nowhere, they showed up and they saw people in need and they helped out. And they didn't expect anything in return. But that's how people lived in Sierra Leone. That's how communities came together. If you see someone in need, you're showing up. Because those are your brothers. And those are your sisters. And they were there for us. And it was incredible. So the, the organization that we went with, uh, Africa Uplifted, their mission is to enrich the lives of the people in Sierra Leone. And I felt like my life was enriched without question while we were there. And that's what it was all about, to enrich the lives of the people we meet. That's what our life of faith is about, amen? amen? To come together and to lift one another up, to be changed and better because we are together, we work together, we support one another, we love one another, and we remind each other over and over that no one, no one is alone in this life and in this world. Our lives are enriched 
when we experience community, and when we are called to go out and to expand our worldview, expand the, the life view that we have to be enriched by meeting people that come from such different places. But through them, you can see spectacular things spectacular ways of being community together and supporting one another and taking pride in what you do and what it means to be family and what it means to to work hard for your family. We are called to expand and to enrich and to grow. And I am so grateful that I went on this trip. I was so grateful that I said yes to this opportunity to get out of my comfort zone and to go meet people that I never would have met if I hadn't said yes and to see a way of life that I never would have seen or experienced if I hadn't said yes. I have a dear friend from high school who, um, who writes a lot, and that's just a practice of hers. She loves reading, and she loves writing, and um, there was a time when she said she was experiencing such writer's block, and I said, well, what are you doing during the day? And she goes, I don't know. I just go to work, and I go to school, and, and that was that, and I said, maybe that's why you're having writer's block, is you're not experiencing anything new. Go out and do something new, and maybe that writer's block will get pushed on through. And I wonder if the same goes for our faith. I've talked to so many of you, so many people in my life in seminary, in church, um, people growing up that experienced times where they feel stuck in their faith. There were times where they had those mountaintop moments and they felt so close to God, but they were then experiencing this time where, where it was just still. They didn't feel like they were progressing in their faith. They didn't feel like they were growing or being challenged in their faith. And so many of us can identify with that, and we wonder why. And we wonder where God is in these moments when we feel stuck. And I wonder, if we go back to the that golden rule, that new commandment that Jesus gave us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to to put on the experience of someone else and imagine our lives as they live them, I wonder if that is perhaps a way that we are called when we are experiencing those times where we're stuck in our faith, where we don't even know what questions to ask or don't even know what God is calling us to next. Maybe we need to stop waiting around for something to fall in our laps and say yes to an adventure and seek new ways of opening up our minds and and meeting people we wouldn't usually meet. So I ask you, how are you called to experience resurrection and transformation in this season of your life. Where you are right now, maybe you've walked into this room because you've felt stuck in your faith. So how is God calling you to to have a holy and Christian adventure? To get out of your comfort zone and experience how God is at work in someone else's life. And how can that enrich your life of faith? And how can you enrich the lives of faith around you by witnessing to what you've seen and what you've done and what you've experienced? It might, maybe it is going on this trip to Sierra Leone. Randy and Eric are leading a trip again this coming January. So maybe your heart is pounding and you're feeling called to go to this place and go experience. But maybe it would be in a way of service or volunteering or taking even a different route to work. Something that gets you out of your comfort zone. Something that helps you experience God's wider world. What are you called to do next? Who are you called to meet? And what are you called to see? Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we are so thankful for a faith that calls us to look beyond ourselves, for a God and for a Savior that asks us not to get to a place and stay there, but to continue to grow and stretch and wonder and ask questions. Thank you for this experience. Thank you for the witness of the people of Sierra Leone. And thank you for perpetually calling us into a life of faith, into a life of togetherness, into a life of loving our neighbor as ourselves. Continue to be with us in this journey, O God. And all God's people said, Amen.